greetings and welcome. This is my name is Amuna. Thank you for joining us. Um, we were just opening up the conversation. So I want to introduce you to the crowd, um, to the family. This is Dr. Wick Wallace. I saw his video on Grandma's Secrets. I want him to tell you guys a little bit about himself. And, and then you can take us into your thought process on Grandma's Secrets and how it's affecting our reality today. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Rick Wallace. Uh, I hold doctor, two, two, dual doctor degrees, uh, a doctorate in theology and one in psychology. I focus, my focus in psychology is on uh, traumatic experiences. Um, I've done a great deal of research and written uh, to this point, 24 books on the black experience uh, from education to absentee fatherhood to what I've called collective cognitive bias reality syndrome, uh, which sort of ties into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, two books that really uh, sort of touch what we're talking about now is my 19th book, uh, which is Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, and uh, book number 22, which is uh, The Undoing of the African American Mind. And <clears throat> basically, when I did the video uh, about grandma's secrets, it was in response to a meme I saw that simply said, if black men who keep uh, uh, romanticizing their grandparents' marriages, how long they lasted, only knew what grandma didn't say or what grandma, grandma didn't tell, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would be a different conversation. And so I chimed in on that. Then I, then I decided to uh, do a video or, on it. And the thing is, when it comes down to grandma's secrets, basically there is a culture, an internal culture inside of uh, the primary culture in which one, black women are expected to be strong, uh, to ignore all wrongdoing, uh, to work and serve others to the detriment of themselves. Uh, and it's just expected. You can see it in the way children look at and deal with their moms even today. So it's not just something that happened with grandma. Because grandma did keep silent, a lot of the behaviors were perpetuated. A lot of the, uh, uh, the narrative nuances were pushed forward. And we're dealing with them now. And it all comes, I mean, it comes out of slavery because in America, we had 246 years of chattel slavery recorded, historical, that, that you know happened. Then we came out of it. And then that is, there's this big long period where people romanticize the liberation of slaves and view it in a very, uh, untrue manner. What I mean by that is this. If you listen to the average narrative, especially when it's being pushed by a European media uh, outlet, it's the idea that until 1865, that was slavery. Mm -hmm. And then we got wise and we freed the slaves. And my God, everything has been unbelievably great since. And the truth of the matter is for slaves, the first 20 or 30 years was probably worse for those who had been slaves. They were probably say it's worse. Why? Because as slaves, we, they were property and they had value. Mm -hmm. As freemen, they no longer had value to white people. They were a threat to white people because they had all the skills. That's facts. So now you're competing with your former, with the, with the, with the, the former slave owner race for jobs. And so you're a threat. And so we had in, in America, we had black codes, which said you couldn't own land. You couldn't start a business in the South. Then we had 12 years of reconstruction, which they like to romanticize and paint white, which actually was the South reestablishing itself to its antebellum roots, where the only thing that changed was the name slavery because they had convict leasing. Mm -hmm. Convict leasing was where they criminalized almost all behavior that were common to slaves, like vagrancy was a felony. You literally could end up getting a 12 year sentence for being homeless. 
okay, then when they find, when they put sent you to prison, then they leased you back out to the very plantations that you had been freed from. You're giving your labor for free once again. The, the, the plantation owner is paying penny on the dollars to lease you. So again, slavery by another name. And we go on through this, but what we don't get and we very rarely deal with is the family dynamic that came out of slavery that we still grapple with. If you go to other places where slavery was in the Western hemisphere, for instance, in Brazil, slavery was slavery. So slavery is never good, but in Brazil, slaves had rights. Uh, the last time rights were mentioned in slavery toward the end of slavery, uh, where we should have been evolving and we weren't, uh, uh, the, the Dred Scott decision, where Dred Scott had sued uh, because he had been free, but his wife wasn't free, and he was suing for the right to be free with his wife. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's ruling was, uh, and read by the uh, Justice uh, Tan, Roger Tan, I believe it is, who said that the black man has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. Okay, no rights that the black, the white man is bound to respect. Okay, this was 18, I wanna say 58 or eight, eight, something like that, very close to moving into uh, the Civil War, where in, uh, in uh, Brazil, marriage was respected so if slaves got married their marriage was respected the family wasn't broken up uh and so many other things well that wasn't the case and often in in to make sure that males didn't bond with their offspring the either the male was sold or the offspring was sold the cult the, the, the entire idea was never to get them to bond and when you sell off a man he moves and he leaves one family behind and he goes to another uh, plantation where he meets another black person. And because he's big and strong, they're going to breed him. So he turns around and makes another family. Well, then you create the psychology and culture of creating families and leaving. You, you create cultures of being able to bed more than one woman because you are being bred. So there's no obligation that is being respected. Now, you may have an obligation to a certain slave that you want to call your wife. But when they say go in here and bed this woman, you're going to go in there and bed that woman because that was your job. You, you were being bred. So this idea that, you know, the cultural behavior, that didn't end. It's not like slavery ended and black men say, okay, now I can be monogamous. So you got a culture. Then you got all the disrespect and the anger and the violence. You got all this stuff. So grandma has been taught to be quiet. That came from slavery too. We're not going to complain because the complaint can cause problems. So what we need is to keep our man safe. So we don't, we don't, we don't expose our men because our men are very vulnerable. The men were the ones that were a, a lot of the vitriol was aimed at. So the women became naturally protective of the men. That's a backward natural, uh, natural order. That's reverse natural order. Um, so we move up and now we're talking about married families. And one of the things that we like to talk about and we like to quote without really truly being honest with ourselves is that up until the 1960s, at least 75% of African-American children were born in the two parent households. And we leave that automatic postulation or automatic assumption that they were born into healthy two parent households, that, that it was love in the house that it wasn't negative energy, that it wasn't violence. And the truth of the matter is, many instances, grandma wasn't saying that, that grandpa is molesting the children. Grandma wasn't saying grandpa is sneaking out and grandpa has two other families outside of this house. Grandma wasn't saying that when y'all go to bed, grandpa beats me. Now, the thing is, even though grandma didn't say it, the reality was there. The energy was there. The negative energy that comes from those negative experiences is now being pushed into the area and the environment of the children. You cannot go through what grandma went through and be healthy. And if you're not healthy, you can't produce a healthy environment. Just because you were quiet about it didn't change the outcome. Why? Because you're sitting there now, and even though you're trying to hide it, 
you're taking a part of you that's no longer there and you're taking what's left and trying to do what a hold of you needs done. There's a part of you missing because your heart is broken. There's a part of you missing because you know he's hurting your babies. There's a part of you missing knowing that he might not come home for another week because he's over there entertaining his other woman. And then after that, he might have to stop by the other woman before he comes back home. You're at a point now you can't even be true, truly uh, sure that you're actually the primary wife. You know, and so all of this is going on and you're trying to raise children. They're wondering why you're edgy. They're wondering why you're snappy. They're wondering why when they reach out for the affection that you, you should be so ably and willingly willing to give it because that's how you're built, that you don't have it to give. And so what we have is now the fallout from grandma where not only are we at a point where only 25% of black children in America are born into two parent households. We're in a situation where black women don't trust black men because, because grandma didn't tell. Now I, I, I dealt with a client the other day that's, that dealt with some things. You got kids now that are finding out in their adulthood who daddy really was. And now we got trauma. Why? Because that's traumatic. The man you thought dad was, dad wasn't. Now you're starting to understand a lot of why mom was the way mom was. But now you've got to come to grasp with this person who's totally not the person you thought they were. And now you need counseling. Probably not going to get it, though. And now we're procreating without the institution of marriage and connectedness that's required in order to really truly raise a child in a wholesome environment you need masculine energy and feminine energy merged together working as one because there are certain things i'm built to do that my wife is not built to do same thing there are certain things she's built to do that i'm not built to do the idea that i can do what a woman can as good as a woman is foolish and the idea that a woman can do what a man can, as good as a man, is foolish. But we have 75, at least 75% in the U.S. attempting it. Co-parenting a child, no matter how involved the father is, isn't the same as having his energy in the home. So then, how did we get here? We got here because we kept hiding what we needed to be dealing with. We never dealt with the elephant in the room. We never sat down and said, we can't allow this. Matter of fact, not only was grandma keeping secrets, grandma would go to pastor and pastor would say, we can't expose him. We can't put him out there. And, and, and then that was his thing, especially grandma and great grandma, depending on how old you are. You know, if you're my age, I was reared by my great grandparents. My great grandfather was born in 1909. So I can go way back. And I dealt in an environment that the average person my age didn't because I was living with my great grandparents. So I was letting you because you was doing it. So uh -huh. I'm just over here like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, what do you think are the, were the real concerns that they had for holding um, the male or whomever accountable? And because it had to be some impetus for her to say, you know what, you're right. I, I cannot reveal this. What were some of those real world um uh, consequences that will come from outing the man? Uh, first and foremost, uh, if we go back far enough, grandpa was the sole provider. If grandma, if grandpa is exposed and he's removed from the house or grandpa is exposed and the marriage ends, the protection ends, the provision ends, our roof over our head becomes questionable. Now, also, because now if he leaves or if he's taken away, I'm left with children. I'm not as marketable as a single mother, a single woman with no children. So finding a, another man to come in and fill his role is going to be difficult. Also, that is the part of the traumatic experience of slavery moving on up through generations 
where simply put, the black woman did not expose the black man because it could have meant his life. Also, the other side of it is the black man is the only protection. He may not have been everything you wanted him to, but there were certain things that you knew if he was there, it wasn't going to happen. And to each family, that was different. Like I said, if he's here, the bills are going to get paid. If he's here, nobody's going to come in, you know, in the middle of the night and take from us. You know, he's going to provide certain things that I cannot do for myself. And if I sit up and I out him, now I'm left on my own to figure this out. And I'm not prepared to do this. And especially back then, the, the, the uh, most of those women didn't have job skills. It wasn't like, okay, I can say, you know, it's over. Even though I've been a housewife, I've got skills. I can go out and get a job. So what am I going to do to survive? So it was one of the base needs of survival, really, as to why she didn't hold this moral ethical code of you did wrong, you should be held accountable. Right. Okay, so now we have the children and we are the grandchildren and the great grandchildren. Like you said, these secrets had real world consequences. Here we are today. When these secrets come forward, you say you, you counsel people. What are some of the ways for those who may be looking, who may be just learning some deep rooted family secrets? What are some of the ways for them to navigate through that pain, that hurt, that betrayal, that feeling of being lost? After we dig it all up, what do they do next? What, what can they do? If at all possible, uh, seek professional help because there's a lot trying to navigate through that. But at the core, the way I normally start with my clients is first and foremost, you have to understand it's not your fault because there's a natural feeling of guilt here. Matter of fact, the most powerful feelings initially is guilt and shame and embarrassment. And you own none of those because you didn't make the choice. You had no control over the choice. That wasn't your choice. It's not your baggage. It's not your bag to carry. You need to let that go. Now you need to come to grips with how you're going to deal with it. If they are still alive. You get to control how you engage them. You get to control on what grounds the relationship continues, if it continues at all. Now, a lot of times I'm dealing with people who have buried trauma so much that we get to a point and realize dad harmed me. And in most instances, it's been so long that there's no legal recourse from a criminal perspective because the statute of limitations has already run out. But we need to deal with it because this needs to be understood. And so that's still, believe it or not, that still is your, especially with the females. This is, it happens to men too. It happens to boys. Boys are molested. Boys are uh, 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 mishandled and raped and, and things of that nature. But when it comes to females, there's still this protection thing. You know, I don't want him to be this. I don't want him. The thing is, what needs to be understood in the family is there has to be a point in time where we reverse the trend of counterprotection. And, and what I've referred to as counterprotection is actually where the person who is revealing the truth is treated like the villain. And the violator is the one protected. Correct. Okay. That's where we got to reverse it, where uh, we stop black sheeping mm. the kid who wants to tell the truth. And we start providing them with an insulation and a protection that says, tell your truth. And see, the beautiful thing about my wife is my wife is a childhood victim. She survived molestation and rape as a child. Wow. And uh, she was uh, the daughter of an alcoholic who was very abusive to her her and her three brothers and her mom. And I can say all of this because she's put it in a book. She did a tell all, but her truth, how she started her healing process. And that's actually how we met is she was referred to me. She came to me, but how we actually uh, met was she came to me, but then I, you know, I counseled or whatever and she started healing. But the beginning of her healing was cathartic processes where I get it off my chest. I'm not going to carry your sin. Right. I'm not going to carry it anymore. I'm going to tell my truth because there's somebody out there who may hear it, who may be encouraged, inspired and empowered to come out and tell their truth. So you, you as long as you're hiding it, you're still a victim. But when you take control over it and you actually say, I'm going to tell my story my way and I'm going to be straightforward about it, you have taken control over it. And at that point, 
Now you are a warrior. And now you are waging war and you are in a position to become the victor. But you have to be willing to tell. And you have to be willing to put out. But we've got to sit up and put pressure on our family members to stop. Everybody seems to have that uncle. Right. At the family reunion. And everybody's talking about, don't let them kids go. Why is he here? Why is he picking up the piece of chicken? <laughs> yeah, you know, why, why is he even invited? Why hasn't somebody in the family put their hands on it? You know, why is he so safe that he's here and everybody else is cowering around him? Why right. are we, but see, a lot of that is the culture, so we have to deal with all of that. To the to the to the black sheeping, um, can we speak to the psychology behind that? Because if the family members are complicit um, in not wanting to break the silence, isn't it easier for for the black sheep out there so that they can understand that they're not crazy? It's easier for them to silence one person than it is for all of these people to come forward and speak the truth. We're so talking, we're talking about we're talking about a combination of uh, reputation and mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance. Right. Uh, from the reputation side is, there's this illusion of who we are as a family. Correct. If that truth gets out, then, because uh, you, you got to understand, uh, I don't know of your awareness of all the different religions here in America, but you 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 know, if you got Kojic, you got holiness, you got all these different religions. And if your family is deeply based in Kojic or in holiness or in whatever, Baptist or whatever, and you got this reputation of being this God-fearing family. And at the core, the patriarch of the family is a uh, is a molester. Mm. The reputation of the family is at stake at levels that people don't even understand. Second of all, there's this thing called cognitive dissonance. When there is a held truth on something, when some people hold a truth to something, when they have a certain belief, and now that belief is being challenged with new evidence, it creates a mental dissonance or a mental discomfort that makes it uneasy. The easiest way to deal with cognitive dissonance is to destroy the messenger. Right. If I destroy the messenger, I destroy the message. I never have to deal with the truth of the message. So the easy thing to do is to catch a person who wants to come out, uh, villainize them, make them into the bad person. And then everybody sees them as the troublemaker. And then the credibility of the troublemaker is shot. So nobody's even listening to them. So even if it gets out, it's not received as truth or it's received as muddy water. So that's the way the game is played. It's a, it's a, it's a point of protecting the reputation and not knowing how to confront and deal with cognitive dissonance. For those black sheep out there, you, you got a word because <laughs> because people will try to convince you that you're crazy and, and that you didn't see and that's not what happened. But so now because sometimes we seek to understand we're feeling the pain, but we look at them as family and we think they should embrace us and we don't understand. And that confusion sends people down a very dark path. But continue. Right. And so in essence, what we have to really truly look at is we have to remove the romanticism mm -hmm. from those past relationships that we tend to want to give a lot of exposure to and credibility to without really truly examining the reality of what took place in those relationships. And that's not fair because now we're building on an illusion. Mm. We're trying to build something solid on something that isn't real. Now, if we confront it, if we say there's a problem, then we can get to the core of the problem. If you get to the core of the problem, you get to the cause. If you get to the cause, you change the trajectory by changing and dealing with what caused it. If you never get to the cause, you never heal. So, so to that point, what about the people who are promoting the marriage on the illusion and wanting the female in this case to, to basically take on the role as the grandmother? not seeing anything wrong with it and saying, if only you would allow me to domestically discipline you, if only you would just be quiet, then this thing would work, right? And so the issue that many are, are trying to portray is the woman coming out of the space that the grandmother was in because it was working. What, what would you say? Because a, a lot of men are, are pushing that narrative now. What are your thoughts around that? Well, I think that we have to be true, and I think that it's going to be an ongoing process. I don't think that you undo decades upon decades 
of uh, erroneous uh, living uh, with some type of panacea. I think that what you have to be able to do is say, okay, how did it work? We're looking at the consequences and the ramifications and repercussions of that life. It didn't work. We're in a worse situation now than we were then because it didn't work. If it had worked, we would have produced productive children, children who can go out into the world and compete in a world that's inherently hostile toward them. We didn't do that. We, we, we pushed out a bunch of broken kids into a world that was ready to devour them. And, and then they were triggered. Why? Because all of the stuff that they grew up with came forth. That even though you tried to hide it, it was things that you couldn't hide. The one thing that I can tell you, as a child who grew up with my grandparents and as a parent who has reared 13 children, is wow. that what you think you're hiding from the kids, most of the time you're not. Mm -hmm. Kids are very, very, very observant. Uh, they're very sharp and they pick up, even if they don't know the specifics, they know when something is wrong. And if something is wrong, it's messing with them emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. If they don't have to know the details. They just know that right now something's not right. And uh, they have to sit up and they have to do that. I, I see somebody's talking about generalization. Uh, I think that when we're talking about something, I think that we always have to understand that uh, you're either talking about generalizations or you're talking about uh, exception. You, I mean, you're either talking about uh, specifics or exceptions, but at the end of the day, there's nothing where everything and everyone is the same. Right. So we don't have to say we don't need to generalize. For those people it doesn't apply to, it doesn't apply to. But what I can tell you is based off of my research, we're talking about anywhere on, on, on the liberal side, 60%. On the conservative side, 40% of black women have been molested or raped or in some way sexually assaulted before the age of 18. So wow. that's not, that's enough where we, that's a problem. That, that's beyond what we would call in science statistically significant. Anytime something is statistically significant, what it's saying is based on a particular observation of a particular social phenomenon, the rate at which it is happening cannot be explained by coincident or happenstance, that there is actually a cause driving it. And what do you think the cause is? I'm sorry, because that statistic is, is, is kind of like... <laughs> I'm taking about what do you think uh, the cause is for the sexual exploitation of young black girls, melanated girls' bodies? Um, by, and is this by their own family members, neighbors, people in their close proximity? It's going to be in close proximity. A lot of times it's going to be incest, which is one form. Other times it's going to be, uh, in, uh, I, I got a lot where the incest isn't the father, the incest is the brother and the cousins. I got a lot of that. Um, and some of it is from, isn't from, uh, is poor supervision where kids are coming into their own adolescent selves mm -hmm. and it's there. And so they're exploring one another because that's who they have access to cousins and cousins and sisters and brothers. Others are, they're simply replaying uh, a behavior that they've gotten on. There's also dads and uncles, uh, with my wife, the first time she was molested was at five years old. And it was a neighbor that the, her parents had trusted to watch her while they were gone. Okay, so it can be a bunch of these things. Now, the thing is, uh, the behavior comes from a lot of different places. You got to understand that some of the most sexually perverse things you can think of, our European slave owners did. I mean, a bunch of things we still think are sick. We, you know, we're, we're right now in a time where there are literally organizations that are pushing a narrative that there's absolutely nothing wrong with pedophilia and a febophilia. And so here we are. And then you got to understand, like I, I grew up born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s, came into my young adulthood in the late 80s. Uh, and so uh, I grew up in a time where I watched adult men look at young girls who were prepubescent or just coming into their puberty 
and say, man, she's going to be fine at, you know, when she gets all those, ooh, she's going to be sick. The fact that you're viewing a child that age and that's going through your mind is a problem. And it was too common. It was a common thing. Man, she's going to be sexy. She's going to be fine when she... But where is the, it's coming from a behavior that was normalized. Right. You normalize something, it becomes a part of the social construct. Just like other sexual deviant acts or sexual deviant realities now have been normalized, and we don't even see anything wrong with them anymore. What, what once was not acceptable has become acceptable, and that has happened in, in situations like that. So how does that re re affect relationships in today's space and time? If that 40 to 60 percent of uh, melanated women have been abused, sexually exploited, does that not go into their adult relationships and why in this space and time many of it is failing, much of it is failing? Oh, it's definitely, it definitely plays a role. You cannot not take it into your relationships. How you deal with men is going to be based on how men dealt with you when you were developing. You're, okay, so, I'm okay. sorry, you didn't say because sometimes people just be like, she just hates men and like it's coming from nowhere, right? No, anytime I hear that and like kind of crazy because the stream I was on before was about uh, some of the uh, hate rhetoric that men are spewing online and mm -hmm. I also address, you know, some of the extreme hate rhetoric that women do, but it was specifically mm -hmm. about a, a specific person who gets a kick out of and has a large following while he dogs black women. Mm -hmm. And I address that, but the thing is, uh, anytime that uh, black men and I, you know, I have I have a, 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 a organization, a rite of passage uh, that I did through the Odyssey Project called Black Men Lead, and it's about properly socializing young black men to operate as men, and that requires proper modeling. Well, in essence, what you have to realize is when you have these men doing this it's coming from somewhere it's it's not just something they come you gotta understand okay let's let's go back for a second real quick master or as they call it massa came in had this couple of slaves that he had a liking to mm -hmm. coming, coming on plantations it wasn't, Massa wasn't raping everyone. It was a couple or maybe one. Uh, the most popular in American culture is Sarah Hemings, which was the slave Thomas uh, Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Well, that happened on every farm. That was his one. That's why the most feared person on every plantation was the mistress. The meanest and most feared person and the most cause of harm and death on plantations was the wife of the owner because she knew what he was doing and she couldn't stop it or control it. But just the, but look at this. Massa comes in, rapes woman. Woman gets pregnant. Woman has baby. Baby is a girl. Baby comes of age, 13 or 14. Massa comes in and rapes baby, who is mm -hmm. his daughter. First of all, underage, mm -hmm. but also his daughter. Mm -hmm. Male slaves see all this. That is a part of social learning theory. It's an observation. It's a behavior. It's a behavior that's accepted by the ruling class. Right. So it's brought in, even though it's not natural. That, then that also, to your point, that was illustrated in the book Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by mm -hmm. Harriet Jacobs. She speaks about um, the vulnerability of the slave girl in the master's house. And uh, basically, she runs away trying to avoid being sexually abused. Right. But she goes into the fate of many, especially if you're fair or if you're pretty or whatever the case may be. It became a curse to be pretty and fair during slave time. And to what you're saying, the men are seeing these young, pretty and fair women. And the only thing that they can think about is violating her. And and the thing is, and just just the term you use is a part of the culture too. the pretty and fair mm -hmm. and how they will use synonymously as if to suggest if you were dark, you weren't pretty. Right. That's what they said. That's what they would say. That's what, yeah, okay. that's where it's coming but, but, from. But all of it. So now you have colorism. Right. Within the black community where within the race itself, there is distinct animosity 
because there's this assumption that being lighter means you're pretty. Correct. Uh, and so all of this comes from out of that and that it comes with baggage, mental and emotional baggage. It doesn't just happen. You just, you know, whether someone acknowledges that it hurts, doesn't matter. It hurts. It has, right. and then it sets so many other barriers up. There's so much going on. There's so much, you know, I mean, like people are triggered behind, behind, behind that. But the whole idea, like you said, being of a lighter complexion came with a curse. Yes. And, 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 and it wasn't just from the white man. Yes. Because see, the black man had an aspiration of having what the white man had because to exactly. him, that was power. And the closest he could get to it was a light complected black woman. That's correct. Okay. So she became the target of both sides. That's correct. He became in many instances, the instrument through which they were going to have their little pissing contest. That's correct. So all of this stuff is coming out now. And in the words of my colleague, Dr. Joy DeGray, at what point did we ever get counseling for it? That's the question I was asking earlier before you came on. At what point did you have a breather um, after slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, going through Great Depression? At what point did you say, now I can deal with my issues, right? Right. Uh, there's a thing in trauma called traumatic injury, and then there's traumatic re-injury. Okay. Right. So say, for instance, if you have someone who walks up and stabs you in the leg, you get stitches, and you're going to be limping around for a while, so you're not at 100%. So you don't function how you normally function because you've got an injury. But as it, it's starting to try to heal, they come along the next time and they hit you in the, head, hit you in the same spot but they hit you in the back. Not only do they bust back open the old injury, they create a new one. Mm -hmm. And every time you start to heal, here comes the next trauma. Here comes the next trauma. That's what we've been experiencing for the last 160 years. It's traumatic re-injury, where we're trying to get over something you've already done to us, and you do something else. And in all of that time, you're telling us that we need to figure it out, and we need to function. Hmm. And so what happens? You get a lot of toxicity, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of frustration, and then they sit up and they blame it on our blackness. No, as Daniel Patrick Monahan said, you got to blame it on their experience. So, so and, and, and definitely the experience is one that and, and I have found in my layman's work is that it's, it's so traumatic that we don't even, as a collective, want to look at the experience. How can you heal from something that you are unwilling? Now you have a little time, you're on YouTube, um, we, 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 we have time, we're on social media, we have an opportunity to sit back a bit. Some people lights are not in danger of being turned off. We have an opportunity to look at exp our experience and even in that, we refuse to do that. What, what part of the game is that, <laughs> for lack of a better word? Uh, what's going on there? where now we, we prefer to be triggered by everything as opposed to sitting back and objectively looking at what has happened. Being triggered is actually a part of traumatic response. Okay. Or what's also re referred to as traumatic memory. Uh, it's not a voluntary reaction. It's literally coming from uh, the coding in the DNA. Trauma literally impacts your DNA, your genetic code. Uh, the study of epigenetics, something that I've written on uh, uh, intensively uh, a great deal. I've, I've studied, I came across epigenetics in studying multi-generational trauma. Okay. Uh, and how trauma is perpetuated through generations because that was always this argument. It's been a hundred and so and so years. Get over it. <laughs> Get over it. And so I was saying, okay, should we be over it? Should and, and, and the first thing I came to through my conclusion of all my studies is time does not heal all wounds. No, it does not. Okay, so that's the first thing. So time in and of itself does not heal all wounds. That there has to be some things that take place that precipitate healing. So I started to study the Jews and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I realized that 
there were children not born during the Holocaust, but born of parents that experienced the Holocaust that were having dreams yeah. about things that happened during the Holocaust that they had never heard of. I mean, right. very vivid dreams that were real experiences. And come to find out that it was in their genetic coding. And so we started to study twins, identical twins, to determine what was causing as they got older, them to be more distinct, uh, distinctive in their appearance to where you could tell the difference between the two. And we come to find out that your experiences uh, have an impact on your genetic expression. So everybody has these genes. So in other words, your experiences can increase your risk for getting cancer. How? Because you have cancer genes. Uh, a certain type of lifestyle uh, a certain type of environment, a healthy environment where there's no stress, a healthy environment where there's a lot of uh, positive energy and love is going to downregulate cancer genes. On the flip side, where there's a lot of stress, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, that same that 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 type of environment will upregulate. Right. In terms of what to kick on or kick off. Kick off. Right. On turn, stressors turn it on genes and turn it right. off genes. Now that's without uh, what you eat or what you don't eat which right. also contributes, but just the experience itself, but also in the procreation process in, 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 in reproduction, the process of meiosis, which is the recreation of reproductive cells. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a cleansing of what's known as epigenetic tags. Epigenetic tags records traumatic experiences. Right. Every tag is the recording of that experience. Well, what, what is supposed to happen in the reproductive process to give the next generation a fighting chance is those tags are supposed to be white clean. But what we find out, if if the traumatic experience was emphatic enough, it can't be wiped completely away. So it's passed on and the mother has 23 chromosomes, the father gives 23 chromosomes to give the 46 chromosomes to the child. In that genetic makeup is that trauma. That's why the kids were having the dreams that their right. parents experienced. So go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I'm going to read John's co comment in a second, John. We're going to keep it clean, John. But before I get to John's comment, in your in your research, because I've read a few books that look at, like you say, the Holocaust and other traumatic experiences, and they validate those experiences. But these same books, like The Body Keeps the Score and It Doesn't Start With You, um, the people who are talking about trauma bonding and the epigenetics, they don't put it, they don't put that over the melanated or the black person's experience. Uh, have you come across research or information or done some of your own that uses that same thought process to explain what's going on in the melanated community? Because I found that they'll talk about everything else except for. Um, right. well, yeah. uh, it's funny that you mentioned uh, the body keeps the score. Yeah. Uh, uh, Basil uh, Van der Kolk, who is by far the foremost expert in, in trauma. Right. Uh, I, I read all of it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I did. I mean, I'm pulling up academic research, and okay. that's the most common name in the research before you even get to his books. I'm talking about he's done that much research. He's had that long of an experience with dealing with it, and mm -hmm. he's written on it so preeminently that everybody's quoting him no matter what research you get his name keeps popping up, up. So that, that made me start reading his books but what i have to say when it comes to the black experience i'm in agreement with dr naeem Agbar. what we have to understand is psychology can't so solely be a eurocentric construct or a eurocentric idea you have to understand that psychology is also not just how we think but how we think based on our experiences so right. you can't use a eurocentric construct of psychology in the black experience because the black experience is different right the black way of uh the black uh experience the black history is different so you have to first reconstruct the entire way you deal with it and see it and operate in it based off of the black experience so it requires a total new look uh the only thing that i've seen is dr jordy gro degray uh mm -hmm. dr howard stevenson dr naeem Akbar, the books that i've written definitely address it from a black perspective and i take what they wrote in their eurocentric books yes. <laughs> and i took it and applied it to us all right it. so that yeah but no they're, they're not gonna do it they're, they're gonna not gonna do, do it, it. They, they'll talk all about ptsd they'll talk all about around it, it. <laughs> but they won't talk about this is why blacks 
still have issues because we've never dealt with it. And they are actually acting out of traumatic in, uh, injury, traumatic memory, and traumatic response. And so, you know, you can't, I mean, a book like The Body Keeps the Score, where mm -hmm. you're talking on an intimate level about how genetically mm -hmm. body records trauma yeah. and then is triggered by something as simple as smell. Yes. Okay, but then you don't want to sit up and say, you could say that's why the Jews. Yes. <laughs> you know, had this, this, and this, but you can't say, and that was 12 years. Yes, exactly. Years. The length of time is so much shorter. Okay, take 246 years of chattel slavery. Yes. And let's keep it real, another 150 years of oppression because we still have not reached equal footing. Right. Okay, and so you're telling me that doesn't have an impact, that that isn't being perpetuated, that that's not generational trauma? Absolutely. Well, I'm asking now as we like push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.